Um, my name is Will Hopkins. I'm the executive director of New Hampshire Peace Action. Um, so I organize. Uh, it's 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 a pretty full job, but I uh, organize uh, uh, rallies, marches, educational programming, um, and campaigns to try to um, make uh, real change for peace. Um, from it, from uh, the state of New Hampshire. More about Peace Action, you know, like the history of it. So Peace Action as a whole and New Hampshire Peace Action came out of the anti-nuclear movement. Um, in New Hampshire, we were founded in 1982 as the New Hampshire Campaign, um, which was a campaign to pass town meeting uh, resolutions that said that it was the will of the towns uh, not to uh, continue to build more nuclear weapons at that point in time. Uh, over time, the mission of New Hampshire Peace Action and the name of New Hampshire Peace Action has changed a few times. Um, and now we are focused primarily on uh, military, or uh, on Pentagon spending um, and uh, US foreign wars and entanglements um, as our policy issues. Um, our major campaigns this year, uh, one will revolve around, um, similar to the freeze campaign, one will revol revolve around trying to get um, town meeting resolutions passed in as many towns as possible um, that say that the will of the towns is that we cut, uh, we make deep, deep cuts to the Pentagon budget. Um, so why did you get involved in uh, Peace Action? Uh, I got started here, um, well, I, I, I guess I'd have to go back to um, the uh, winter of 2000-2001. Um, when I was a sophomore at the University of Maine at Farmington. And I took second semester off to skiing uh, at Tenney Mountain in Plymouth. And there was a guy who I taught with who'd done six years in the New Hampshire National Guard. Um, and he would tell me stories about skiing and ice climbing and rock climbing and snowshoeing at, at, at drill um, and how he got paid for this and that they were, would cover college, uh, you know, cover funding college. Mind you, this is the winter of 2000, 2001, so there's... The World Trade Towers were still standing tall. Uh, it was a very different world, and the idea of being in the National Guard um, meant that uh, that I might get called in for flooding or ice storms or that sort of thing. Uh, but this unit had been in existence for 27 years when I joined. I've uh, been called in only for ice storms and flooding. Um, um, and so I, joining the Guard was kind of a... Uh, uh, when the snow melted and I realized I couldn't teach skiing in the summertime, I needed something to do with myself, and uh, it sounded like fun. I knew it would get me in shape for rugby season. Um, and so I joined the National Guard, and of course I graduated at the tail end of August 2001, which is a very interesting time to graduate uh, basic training as an infantry. Um, I ended up in Iraq uh, at the beginning of 2004, um, and I stayed until February of 2005. Um, and it was, uh, having watched the lead up to that war, I did not believe uh, any of the reports of weapons of mass destruction. I'd read the actual UN inspectors reports. Um, I saw what we were doing as clearly immoral and probably illegal. Um, and, I, and I think, you know, most, most attorney generals uh, and, and uh, many legal experts agree that that war was well outside the legal bounds um, laid out in the Constitution. Mm. Um, so... As I was leaving, I struggled with the idea of resisting uh, and refusing to go. But at that point in time, um, people were serving. Um, at that point, Aaron Watata was a first lieutenant. I believe he did about 18 months in prison for refusing to go. Mm -hmm. And he made a very compelling legal argument um, that the war was illegal. Uh, but they still sent him to prison. And so I knew, despite my feeling that uh, in keeping my oath to the Constitution, I should resist, Mm -hmm. um, I was pretty much, you know, it was go to war or go to jail for me. Um, and I chose to go to war, um, which in hindsight, I, I don't think I would make the same choice again. Mm -hmm. uh, I think I'd have probably served, served the time behind bars. But living with the labels convict, coward, traitor were too scary to me at that point in my life. Uh, and war wasn't as scary. Um, so I went and uh, I was decorated for valor during my time there, um, had uh I had, I had a number of engagements. I don't know what that number is, but um, I know I had one week where I had 
uh, three firefights. Um, and, uh, so it was a, it was a really long year. Um, and, uh, I kind of came home and was left with this feeling that I had done something very wrong, um, that I'd been part of an invading army, um, and that I had, um, possibly killed people who were just trying to defend their homes from foreign invaders, which is something I could identify with as a guardsman. Um, you know, that was part of my, why I was signing up because I thought it was okay to want to defend your home. Um, and so I came home, I was left with a, with a real sense of guilt. And, uh, I, uh, once I got out of the guard, I finished my term in May of 2000. Um, and very soon thereafter, I first got involved with, um, Dennis Kucinich's presidential primary campaign mm. um, because he was running on a, on a platform of ending that war quickly um, and, and a lot of other things that I thought were sensible policies. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, from there, people around New Hampshire noticed that there was an Iraq war vet out speaking out. Uh, and pretty soon I was uh, part of a speaking series with New Hampshire Peace Action. Um, and I ended up on the board. And then when our director left in 2009, uh, at that point, I'd finished my bachelor's and uh, a master's in business admin, and um, I'd uh, organized in the 2007-2008 um, uh, for the New Hampshire Democratic Party, uh, which is kind of a, a black spot on my record, having seen Democrats have done over the past <laughs> six years. I'm, I'm not too proud of that I worked for the party, but I did. Uh -huh. uh, and. Uh, you know, having a little bit of organizing and MBA and the combat experience was enough that I ended up doing this job. Um, and I think I've learned to do it pretty well. Yeah, I actually wanted to talk a little bit about, um, yeah, the Democratic Party and some of the other topics we, you know, you touched over. The Constitution, the rule of law, um, and the Democratic Party, uh, especially um, given uh, the drone program that uh, Obama apparently has decided is okay that he can just assassinate u.s citizens um and with the very interesting position that um a lot of anti-war folks like myself are being put in um you know having to agree with someone like rand paul um who uh filibustered yesterday um and i i think you know he deserves a lot of credit for that but i, I i'd like to hear your perspective on on that yeah, I'm, I'm right with you. I mean, the idea that I um, would uh, would have to look to Senator Rand Paul as a hero, <laughs> and he was yesterday. I mean, he was the hero of the day. He was the only person standing up for uh, standing up against a practice that's clearly unconstitutional, um, that is that is brutal. Um, it, it's I mean, it's murder straight up. Mm -hmm. um, and he was the only person who was willing to stand up and, and say, no, this is not acceptable. Um, and challenge that. Uh, not the only person, but he was, he was, uh, you know, he, he stood up and, and fought it. And, um, you know, I, I, I have a, a decent respect for, uh, his father, Ron Paul. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, I don't agree with uh, a, a number of his policies, but he has been, uh, a very principled, um, uh, you know, uh, anti-war, you know, he's, he's favored a legal and sensible foreign policy. Mm -hmm. policy for this country for a long time um, and I have a huge respect for him uh, Rand Paul I have never seen quite I've never held in quite the same esteem mm -hmm. uh, but yesterday he he was and what he did um, was something that I would think anybody who considers himself uh, patriotic or um, somebody who is who is supporting the Constitution should do mm -hmm. uh, I think it was really shameful um, that people weren't speaking out uh, John Brennan uh, was uh, as as uh, the head of the drone program, mm -hmm. uh, murdered American civilians. And, uh, as far as I'm concerned, he belongs in prison, not a head of the CIA. Yeah, and I guess the thing that's really frustrating for me too is, um, uh, and I don't know how much you can talk about this because you know you're the head of a non uh, a nonpartisan organization. Um, just how, like, why were there no Democrats joining him on the floor? Like, if that if if these same policies had been pursued under George W. Bush's administration, I think he would have been impeached. Absolutely. Um, you know, we see a, a huge level of cowardice, and I, I, I think I can, I mean, I can talk about the individual actions of politicians, mm -hmm. and um, you know, the entire Democratic Party just uh, 
you know, displayed, I don't know if I'd call it cowardice or corruption, mm -hmm. um, but the, the complete inability to, uh, to morally look at what they're, what they're doing or saying or supporting. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we, we have uh, a practice that is, uh, it, it's brutal. Uh, it has led to the, ki the killing of an American child, Abdul Rahman al um, and, uh, and, and standing up for it is, is it, it's clearly the moral, the moral stance to take at this point. Um, and to see nobody in the Democratic Party, the party that I, um, you know, that I, that I worked for four years ago, mm -hmm. um, not that it was a different party then or anything, but, you know, that I worked for because I believed that, that, um, I believe that there was some sort of directional push that could be mm -hmm. done here. That things could get better if we would get if we could get better politicians in. Right. Um, and they've proven that they're that they're interested in gain for their party, uh, but that they don't actually have a moral compass. Or, um, and it, it was shameful. And as a, and as a party, I think that the that the, the Democratic Party has, uh, you know, they they have uh, some pretty pretty great rhetoric from time to time. Um, you know that they, they they say that they're going to support the people against um, you know uh, multinational mega corps that are that are controlling our policy mm -hmm. uh, and on and on. But when you look at who's funding them and when you look at what they do when they actually get to Washington, mm -hmm. uh, there's no there there is there's nobody uh, you know, with the exception of the Barbara Lees and and the occasional uh, Dennis Kucinichs out there. Um, there's nobody in Washington who's working in our best interests. Uh, mm -hmm. Everybody's on the take. Everybody is um, is getting paid by. Uh, you can't be taken seriously as a candidate for office if you mm -hmm. don't have uh, the corporate sponsorship. Right. Uh, you can't get the corporate sponsorship unless you hold the uh, unless you unless you hold their their uh, the value of. Um, corporate profiteering above the value of human beings. You and I both um, worked or, or uh, participated in the 2008 um, campaign of Dennis Kucinich. Um, and I know as an intern, um, starting from the summer of 2007, all the way up until when he dropped out in February of, wait, February of 2008, I think that's right. I really saw firsthand how, exactly how that, that corrupting influence of money works. How if, if you're a candidate like Dennis Kucinich or if you're um, a party like the Green Party and you refuse to take the vast amounts of corporate money, um, then you don't have the millions of dollars to spend on, um, uh, you know, the advertising. And then if you don't have money to spend on advertising on TV, the TV, uh, stations don't take you seriously and I think there's probably and I can't say this with any um, it's it's it is conjecture but there's certainly um, you know one has to wonder looking at who actually owns the media like um, you know Verizon and all of their subsidiaries like GE owns you know vast swaths of the television media and radio and newspapers um, and they also happen to own um, you know, uh, companies that are involved in the military industrial complex and in, involved in the, um, you know, the oil industry and involved in uh, nuclear, the uh, building of nuclear weapons and nucle uh, nuclear power facilities. Um, so, yeah, I mean, one has to wonder, like, what degree of separation there is between all of these different entities. Look at who was just selected as the head of the FDA, uh, mm -hmm. or not the head, but the, the deputy, deputy director of food safety, um, I believe was his title. And he came straight from Monsanto, mm -hmm. uh, which is a, a company that has made statements that they are not, it, it is not their job to protect our safety, that that's up to the right. FDA. And we take their executives who, you know, they say it's our job to make money. And right. we take their executives and put them in the FDA, the FDA and you know, and, and pretend like they're, they're actually going to uh, going to have an honest uh, reflection of the effects of, of uh, you know, genetically modified crops and, and Roundup on our food. Mm -hmm. um, it's, just, it's absurd. I mean, you're talking about people who are, who are making millions in some cases. Mm -hmm. uh, John Kerry uh, was just selected as Secretary of State, um, and John Kerry has over $26 million invested in, uh, in military contractors. So here's a man who has a huge amount to gain if diplomacy fails, and we make him Secretary of State. Um, you know, and, it, and that, that, uh, you know, that, that continues on at, at every level. Um, when we talk about the media, 
um, you know, I, I, as I said, I was an MBA, and I remember in my first MBA course, um, the professor went up front, and you know, this is kind of the introduction to what this, you know, what this program is going to be. And the professor said the the most important thing you have to understand about the MBA's job is the MBA's job is to maximize profit to the shareholders, mm-hmm. um, and that is a recurring theme of business management. Your job in a business is to maximize profit to the shareholders. Um, and so we have a government that has revolving doors with corporations um, where people's job is to maximize profit to the shareholders. You can't get into that government unless you are part of that, uh, that corporate system, um, unless you have uh, guaranteed those corporate funders that you're going to act in their best interest. Mm-hmm. Um, and the, the media also is trying to maximize their profits. Most of them have interlocking directorates yeah. uh, with military contractors. You have uh, MSNBC and GE. Uh, GE previously owned MSNBC, mm-hmm. um, but is uh, I, I think there has been a formal uh, cutting of that tie. But it's still um, silly to suggest that uh, there's no influence. Mm-hmm. Um, and then you also have the simple reality that if, uh, if in the media your goal is to maximize profits to the shareholders because we're talking about a corporate media um, uh, war gets ratings conflict gets gets ratings um, suffering gets ratings um, and so it, it, it is in their interest to see to it that those things continue and that they that they cover them uh, war is one of the best things for all media outlets because mm-hmm. people tune in to learn to, to watch war um, to find out what's going on and, uh, now this is something that uh, people are increasingly uh, looking for alternative media, but when it comes to war, they turn to the to the mainstream. You're watching the Punk Patriot to life, liberty, and pursuit of a less fucked up government. If you like this video, please donate what you think it was worth. Um, you can find the link down in uh, the description of the video. Um, also, let me know what you think in the comments section. Please share this video with your friends and your enemies. The only way that this uh, channel will expand is through word of mouth and people like you. So thank you very much. Peace. Hero